tables, chairs, canterburies, davenports, marquees, armoires, lit de repos, bureaus, cellarettes, chesterfields, fauteuils, chiffonniers, credenzas, biedermeyers. All of these and more are possible for your miniature D&D or other fantasy worlds. We're going to lean heavily on the power of things like coffee stir sticks, popsicle sticks, tongue depressors. My personal preference for doing wood in my miniatures modeling is to use actual real wood as opposed to foam for a few reasons. One, it looks the most like wood. Two, it's easier. You just paint it. And three, it's way more durable. Today we're going to do a series of little rapid fire projects with the goals of speed and ease. But here at the front of the video, just one time, let's talk about joinery and painting. To build this miniature furniture, a surefire way is to use white PVA glue such as Elmer's. Now this tends to spread and you have to be very patient, it can take 15 minutes to an hour to dry. Plus you've got to pin the pieces in place while they do. So what I like to do is use super glue and super glue accelerant. You'll want to have a good box cutter or utility knife and some snips like wire cutters or flush cut modeling sprue snips like these here. Very cheap, under $10 and readily available. These cuts we're making can end up being pretty crude, so it's helpful to have a bit of sandpaper nearby. Something in the realm of 200 to 400 grit, available at any hardware store for a few bucks. Whenever you make a cut, take three seconds and just rub the fresh end on that sandpaper to smooth it out. Don't make it perfect, you're just getting rid of the roughness. Then, for gluing, this Bob Smith brand is very popular, it's on Amazon. Any accelerant will work, but you can see that even though this is a spray bottle, I usually use it as like a point applicator because the fluid gets into that tube and stays there from capillary action till you touch it to something else. So I rarely ever actually use the spray function. This is how I use accelerant. So place the super glue on one piece and the accelerant on the other, then join them. The glue cures within one second so it has no time to spread out where it can become shiny and interfere with painting later. And as for the glue, try and find a brand that has a fine point tip for a dispenser because this is some very finicky miniature work that we're doing. Also, I recommend normal super glue, not a gel control type super glue. Just plain old Loctite or Gorilla or something like that. And when it comes to painting or tinting or coloring the wood, there are so many ways to go. But again, we're assuming here that we're going for speed and ease, cheapness, probably nothing more than you would find at your average crafting supply store. So. Really, I'm just going to touch on two options today. You've got your cheap acrylic craft paints. These are usually around a dollar a bottle. Low pigment content, but cheap and quick drying. Or oil-based paints, where you'll need a thinner and then the thick oil-based paint itself. When using cheap acrylics, I like to water it down about 50-50. Not as watered down as you might think. It's still kind of soupy. Thicker than whole milk, but still kind of runny. And by painting this onto the wood and then wiping away the excess, we get a fairly decent color density. Now when it dries, you'll see that it is fairly desaturated. That's just a trait of these cheap paints. And maybe it's the look that you're going for, in which case, great. But you can wait an hour or two for this to totally dry and then do a second coat. And you end up with a result that's hmm, fairly good. As for oil-based paints, this is something I only personally latched onto in the past couple years. And these aren't cheap. Uh, this tube, I think, was around $10, but it is like a lifetime supply. Same for the thinner, because we're doing miniatures work. We're not doing a big canvas painting, which is what these are mostly meant for. So we have a lifetime supply here. So with just a little bit of the thinner and a glob of paint, we mix it down into a consistency that's like this. It's hard to show on video or talk about. You'll just have to experiment with it. I promise within two or three mixes, you'll have it down and then this just gets slathered on the wood. Now you could wipe off the excess here, let it dry and do a second coat. When there's not as much thinner on there, it'll dry quicker, so that is the route to go. I like the real rich color density. I usually do one coat and just let it sit for a few hours to dry. But as you can see, the result of the oil-based paints is way richer than the acrylic paints. Here's an advanced shot of something later in this video. The bookcase on the right was painted with oil-based and I mixed in some orange there as well. And the one on the left is a brown acrylic craft paint. So you can see one is just a little more desaturated, a little more washed out. If you're brand new getting into this, I suggest just go ahead for the oil paints. 
The color pop is just wonderful. Also, any brushes you use for oil paints, set them aside in a spot, dedicate them always for oil paints. I don't bother rinsing them out in mineral spirits or cleaning them. Just wipe off all the excess when I'm done and then let them sit. But they can't be used for anything else because they've still got some oil in them. All right, that's how we're gonna build. That's how we're gonna paint. Let's start making some furniture. And remember, if you're a 3D printer, you must check out Heroes Horde and their outstanding selection of models for your tabletop gaming, including the original True Tiles lines. Let's start with something very simple, though all of this is simple. A round table such as you might find in a tavern. Begin with some food packaging cardstock, like a cereal box, something of that thickness. Draw out a circle and cut it out. I'm using a compass for perfection, but you could trace a coin or just freehand it. Doesn't really matter. Then we go to our first mainstay, coffee stirrers. These are fantastic. They're thin but durable and made of real wood. Chop these down to planks that overhang the circle and then glue them on. After a few minutes when the glue is all set, take some heavy duty scissors like kitchen scissors and work your way around the edge. The great thing about these coffee stirrers is they can be cut with good scissors. You can see here that they're shattering and crumbling away, and they break biased to the side that's not glued down, to whatever side is unsecured. So rather than place and trace and try and cut each individual piece to the right curve, you just glue them all on first and then lop off the excess. Now if you've been to your crafting store like Michael's or Hobby Lobby or whatever you have in your part of the world, you've probably seen this bit or something like it. Some kind of cylindrical wood bit. Doesn't really matter. Just stick it to the tabletop and you're done. I'm using some hot glue here, just in the interest of speed, but that's it, circular table. Now how about rectangular tables? Here's how I like to do them. I have these jumbo mega popsicle sticks or craft sticks. They're like an inch and a quarter wide, very hefty. So if we take this and just cut it to the desired length of the table, and then go back to our coffee stirrers and then chop lengths to glue to the side, we can make an apron. A quick note on technique here, and this applies for when you're miniature painting as well. Notice that my pinky fingers are touching each other. I'm drawing this bead of glue and then attaching the apron. This is a very finicky process. Trying to do it like suspended in midair or with your hands as two entities makes it very difficult. Touch your outer fingers together to get a triangle of power. And now for whatever the things are you're manipulating, you're doing that with your fingers as opposed to your wrists. Much easier to control this way. For the legs of this table, I'm gonna use some kebab skewers, but you could use any kind of wooden dowel. The crafting store will probably have thin square shaped dowels if you like. And with the apron, we have three surfaces to glue to, which is gonna make these legs very, very strong. Two axes of control is great, three is even better. So despite the small nature of these, this is very, very sturdy. It's gonna hold up if you toss it in a bin or something. To be at a table, you need chairs. For this, we have some standard popsicle sticks and some toothpicks. Chop the end of the popsicle stick to about an inch, maybe a little less than that, and then chop off a little more to act as the seat and glue this on. Because you'll never see the underside of the seat, what I like to do is slather in a little more super glue under there and hit it with accelerant. It's gonna be ugly and it won't paint well, but it doesn't matter, you'll never see it. And we need that strength for this small piece and this small connection. Same goes for the outer legs. I like to apply the glue to the leg and the applicator onto the bottom of the seat and attach it that way very quickly. And once they're attached, I layer in a little more super glue and cure it quickly with accelerant. So despite how fragile this looks, these actually are very strong. This is a fancy chair, so after painting up the wood or tinting it, I made some cushions just by cutting some very thick cardstock, painting it, and then gluing it on. So that makes a pretty nice fancy aristocratic chair you might find in a manor. But how about ramshackle crude chairs like you might find in a tavern at the wrong side of town? Well, take a look at these. These are match sticks. They're like toothpicks, but square. They're not dowels, they're more fragile than that. But again, cut them to something a little less than an inch. And I like to use tape rolled upside down to stick them down as I'm gluing together. The first thing I do is the seat. This'll bind those two back posts and then you shouldn't need the tape anymore. Then a small cross member at the top of the back posts. And finally the legs. 
And once again, everything on the underside of the seat gets soaked with super glue and then accelerantized to firm up the legs. And once again, this is much stronger than it looks like on camera. Let's build a bed. Begin with a rectangle of thick cardstock. Use a miniature to gauge the size. I think this was like one and a quarter by one and a half or something like that. Doesn't really matter. Then take some foam board, which you can find at any crafting supply store. Though this stuff comes from Dollar Tree and it's called Ready Board. It's commonly used because the paper peels off really well from it. And after gluing it to the cardstock, go ahead and paint it up with the desired color now. Then we go back to our coffee stirrer sticks yet again. Lengths are glued around to create the bed frame. However, unlike the table apron, we don't connect them at the corners. In fact, we want to leave them slightly short at the corners because that is where we use more match sticks or dowels or whatever you want to use as the bed posts or the legs. Also, we can go back to that foam board and cut small bits of it to use as pillows. Paint if you like, but I don't really think it's necessary. You can have a lot of fun with this. Make a four post bed, hang curtains, etc. Now, Jenga knockoffs. These I found at the dollar store, but surely they're available elsewhere. The one on the left is actually a miniature size, and these are gonna be very useful. In fact, that's what we're gonna lean on here for the next few projects. If we take some large popsicle sticks, we can cut them down to look like cabinet doors. So this can make a decent dresser or a hutch. After it's painted, we can attach some metal bits as the door poles or other decorative filigree. Can also stand it upright and use coffee stir sticks as doors to make a wardrobe. Once again, attaching any metal bits after the painting is done. Here's sort of a combination unit that you might find in a kitchen. Fundamentally a bookshelf, but it's built around one of those Jenga blocks as the base. Or maybe you want a simple counter. Take two of the blocks, hot glue them together, and then attach some popsicle stick on top. Simple bar or countertop. You could also chop those popsicle sticks such that the end is still there and you have a nice rounded end for style. As for bookshelves, I've covered them many times before. Basically, cut and glue a bunch of popsicle sticks together, but for this video, I want to get a smoother result because chopping those popsicle sticks leaves very rough edges and the sticks themselves are rounded on the long edge, which isn't always the look that I want. So with these jumbo sized craft sticks, you don't need a saw. You can use your crafting knife or your utility knife. Just make many light passes and you'll get a very smooth cut. And this is true for going across the grain and with the grain. So. That means you can cut down nice smooth looking planks with sharp edges. So for giggles, I built a whole bookshelf this way. No standard popsicle sticks, just custom cut down planks of wood. And you can see the difference here. One would look good in like the cave of a nomad wizard or something, but the other actually looks pretty good and would fit in a nice house. It looks well made. And also remember the glue that's beaded up at the back, you'll never see because you're going to mount books in there. So that's bookshelves. Now let's try a few fancier things. First up, for sake of completeness, here's a few pieces that I did in the past. I'll put a card on the screen and a link in the description below for the video in which I made these. Check it out at your leisure. It's a video I'm pretty proud of. And if you really are into this stuff, consider checking out and supporting my Patreon. Anyway, those aside, how about a book wheel? Start out by cutting two hexagons from very thick cardstock. You could measure out and properly draw a symmetric hexagon, but I got lazy here and I just freehanded it. So two of those, and then more popsicle sticks and coffee stirrers, and glue them together lengthwise to make a sort of ledge or a shelf. Make three of these, and then they're mounted to the hexagon sides, like this. From some thinner card stock like cereal box, I used my small hole punch to make some, uh, not rivets, but like this is the pole that would be coming through to which the shelf is mounted and allows it to rotate as the entire assembly rotates. 
For the frame, don't overthink it, just use more coffee stirrers, and a little touch here and there can go a long way. For the cross beams that actually sit on the floor, I mitered them at about 45 degrees. Also, a couple of decorative gear looking beads attached to the outsides. This could be like the mechanism that the user does to turn the entire assembly, or it could just be decorative, doesn't matter. And for strength, I put in a toothpick or a dowel going across at the bottom as well. And there we go, a nice book wheel, fitting for any wizard's laboratory or study. How about a grand piano? You can Google image search the shape of a grand piano and try to replicate it freehand or use a compass like I'm doing here. Ultimately, it won't really matter. But the shape is drawn onto some very thick cardstock and then cut out. By the way, the thick cardstock I've been using is graphics medium chipboard. It's the thick stuff you find at the back of a legal pad, but you can buy it in bulk like I do if you want. There's links in the video description below. Anyway, with that cut out, I traced the shape onto some more cardstock as well as some double corrugated cardboard. Double corrugated cardboard is a quarter inch thick. The only reason we're using it here is to get thickness for the body of the piano. If you can achieve it a different way, go for it. But I cut it out slightly inside the line. And the reason for that is all three of these are glued together in a sandwich. And now with the center portion recessed, there's lots of room for the hot glue to go into. And we won't get any squeezing out as we apply the outer cladding which is just another strip of thin cardstock. For the legs, poke some holes, inject with glue, and stick a toothpick in there. Then chop it to length. Easy. And because this is a classy joint, we want a candle there. So here's a standard bead with a hole in it. And here is a standard paper clip, the plastic coated kind. By stripping away the last millimeter or two of the jacket, we can paint it beige like wax, and the exposed metal can be painted as a flame. For the keys, I cheated. I printed and pasted them. If you have a steadier hand than me, you could easily paint them on. Lastly, I would encourage you to think outside the box. Here's a finger skateboard toy, but this makes a good foundation for a chaise lounge. Let's tear those wheels off and remove the sticker. And as I mentioned earlier, all craft stores have a section of an aisle dedicated to wood shapes, just wood bits of all sorts. I found an assorted pack of ovals and teardrops and circles. I'm going to take this teardrop shape here because it's just about the size of the skateboard. And I'll paint that up separately while I prime the skateboard with God's Gift to Humanity Rust-Oleum 2X Flat Gray. And then I painted it with gold. This is Army Painter Bright Gold from the new War Paints Fanatic range. Army Painter is a friend of the channel, and these are some of the best paints I've ever used. Then we can wash it down with some sepia tone or some other ruddy colored wash. Then I glued the backing to it. And finally for the cushioning, I have some of this thin foam like sheeting from the craft store. It's cheap, it's thin, it's flexible, it's durable. It's not like the foam board we used earlier. So this has a very tough, dry texture to it. But by carefully slicing out the right shape, using a mechanical pencil to indent the pins of the pin cushion, painting it up, and then gluing it on, we get a nice cushioned chaise lounge. Modularity is so fun. Having a box full of miniature furniture that you've scratch built and painted is really gratifying and it's like the pre-game prep is fun. It's like Legos as you assemble whatever, the tavern or the mansion foyer or whatever the players are gonna run into tonight. Well, thanks for joining me in the armory today. If this is somehow your first exposure to all this miniature scratch building stuff, you should know the Tabletop Crafters Guild on Facebook is a group with over 40,000 members doing stuff exactly like this, two thirds of which are more skilled than me. So remember, resource links are in the video description below. Until next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games.